Hello, this is Professor Matt Catrulis of Rio Hondo College, and this is the video for Experiment 4, Atoms and Elements. Uh, this is what we consider one of our dry labs in that there is really no actual chemical measurement involved in this experiment. It's largely based on observations. So I'm going to go through this experiment part by part, and if you would like, you are uh, more than welcome to pause between the different parts and complete them as you go. So the first part, part A, is largely about getting you familiar with what some of the chemical elements are. And what we do is we visually present you with some of the more common elements that you uh, encounter in chemistry. And you'll need a periodic table to complete this activity, so there should be a periodic table available in your textbook, and your instructor will certainly provide you with one if you need be as well. And you will need a periodic table really throughout this class, so for the next several experiments and certainly to prepare for exams. So what I'm going to do here is show you pictures of 14 elements in the following slides. And then following the directions uh, that come a few pages earlier, on page 43, you're going to complete the top half of that page uh, by giving some information that you're requested to give. So symbol, atomic number. And then in the next column over, you'll be asked to describe the color of the element as best as you can. Don't worry about being obsessive about this. Don't say, oh, it's burnt sienna with highlights of lavender or something like that. Just give a fairly simple color for that. And most importantly, if something has uh, no color at all, we say it's colorless, not clear. So for example, water is colorless, and that is how we describe its color. Uh, we would also say it is clear, but that's not color. Clear is uh, whether or it's it's kind of an optical quality so to speak whether you can see through something or not so for color if something lacks color say simply colorless when we talk about uh, something being lustrous something we usually talk about with metal we usually mean that something is shiny so for example when you look at aluminum foil one side is very lustrous and the other side is a little bit more dull. So there really need to be only three words in this column. So you'll look at the picture and say this looks like a shiny element, uh, dull, meaning it's not reflecting a lot of light, and then none if the terms don't apply at all. Uh, so for example, things like air. Air is not shiny and air is not dull. Um, air is also not an element, but it's made up of elements. And uh, we, so we would say none for that. And finally, you want to indicate whether the element that you're observing is a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid. You'll recall that in the periodic table, you have a thick stair-step line uh, running down the right side. The elements to the right of that stair-step line are primarily non-metals. The elements to the left are primarily metals. Uh, with the exception of hydrogen, which of course is a non-metal. And then the elements on either side of that line are metalloids, except for aluminum, which is a metal. So let me say we were going to fill this out. Let me just give you an example of how you might fill out uh, the row for these two elements, cobalt and chlorine, which are not part of the assignment. So this is pretty much what the table looks like. So cobalt, and you would look up its symbol if you didn't know it by memory, is CO. Its atomic number is 27, also found on the periodic table. The color, some people might say silvery, some people might say light gray, but that's a good enough description. It is shiny, and it is not only clearly metal as you look at it, it's a metal because it's on the left side of the periodic table, and it's in the group of elements called the transition metals. Now, incidentally, that cube right there is not how cobalt naturally occurs. Someone has uh, shaped that to look like a cube, but with it, you can clearly see that there is luster. It is definitely shiny. 
chlorine is a gas and it's that uh, gas that's contained within this container called an ampule. So it's Cl and 17 is its atomic number. The color is green. We wouldn't say that this is shiny or dull. Uh, it's none. Gases don't, we don't really look at a, a shininess or luster property. And with this being far on the right side of the periodic table, in the halogens, it is a nonmetal. Okay, so I'm going to show you now the first five elements that are on that table. They are aluminum, carbon, copper, iron, and magnesium. I've taken these pictures all from the internet, primarily from Wikipedia or from some source of Google. Uh, carbon is occurring here in its graphite form. It can also present as diamond. And uh, I'm just showing you this because it's going to be more common. And if you need some time, go ahead and pause this video. And then when you're ready, we'll continue with the next set of elements. Continuing on. Uh, here I have a sample of nickel. Here I have containers that contain nitrogen and oxygen, uh, maybe or maybe not. Uh, but this is exactly what nitrogen looks like. Uh, and in fact, you know, it looks exactly like air. Nitrogen makes up over 75% of the air. So its description is uh, the, exactly the same way you would describe air. The same is true of oxygen, which is also a major constituent of air. It looks just like air. Phosphorus occurs in many forms. This is white phosphorus. And white phosphorus right here is being stored in the water. So that's what you're looking at, not the water here. The reason it is stored in water is because when exposed to the oxygen in the air, it will spontaneously catch fire and burn uh, at a very high temperature. So it's always stored underwater. And then here is the uh, uh, metalloid silicon. So I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next slide. If you need more time, please pause. And here are four more elements. So silver, the yellow powder sulfur, tin. Uh, tin, by the way, should be described as shiny. Uh, this particular sample isn't one of the shiniest uh, that I've seen, but it can definitely be very shiny. And zinc. Again, if you need more time, pause the video. But I'm going to go ahead and go on now to part B. So part B is on the periodic table. And over here on the right, I'm showing a, a fairly typical example of what we might see there. Now, for part B, you need to follow the directions very carefully. I'm not going to necessarily go through every step. So please don't say, oh, you didn't mention that. No, the instructions are on page 40. Follow them very exactly. You only want to include the 15 elements from part A the ones that you've just seen the pictures of, and that does not include cobalt or chlorine, which I just showed as examples. And for those 15 elements, and only those 15 elements, you want to fill them in in their respective boxes, just like this. So the number, and then its symbol. Don't worry about the name of the element, don't worry about the atomic mass, just the number and the name of the element. On step three, where it asks you to outline various sets of elements, for example, the halogens or the alkali metals, you just want to draw a thick box around each of those groups of elements, preferably with a colored pencil so we could distinguish them, or you could highlight them, or uh, preferably any way of using color would be ideal. And then all the other directions for this part of the experiment should be very clear. Uh, for question three on the questions section, it asks you to make predictions on whether certain elements are shiny or not. And what you should do after making your predictions is go ahead and do an internet search to see whether your prediction 
of shiny versus dull is correct. And here is a nice color-coded periodic table to sort of show you what I mean in terms of the labeling. Uh, so first note that your periodic table that you're given on your report sheet only has the first five periods. So those are the period numbers there. So it just goes down to there and then it cuts off essentially everything below. And recall here, that, again, these are color-coded alkali metals or all of these elements not including hydrogen. And so on your own periodic table, you could just make a nice box around here. And if you can color code those, that would be great. Uh, and then the alkali earths over here, alkaline earths, excuse me. And uh, then you've got your transition metals and halogens and noble gases as well. And here is the stair step line I was referring to that generally separates the metals from the nonmetals, and here are our metalloids. You'll notice all the elements on either side of the stair step line except for aluminum. Going on to part C, which talks about the atom, uh, you should have covered all of this material in lecture uh, when we talk about the number of protons, numbers of neutrons, and number of electrons that make up an atom. So just a real quick review. The atomic number, which is commonly given the symbol Z, is exactly the same thing as the number of protons. The number of protons and electrons has to be the same for a neutral atom. It is different for an ion. On this particular exercise, all of the atoms will be neutral. So it will be the case that protons and electrons are the same. The mass number, which is A, is the sum of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. And it is not the same as the atomic mass. If you look at your periodic table and you see values which have decimal points in them, like for example under helium 4.003, uh, those are going to be atomic masses and not the same as mass number. Different concept. So you'll want to review the formulas on the bottom of page 37, and you'll want to also take a look at table 4.2 on page 38. Uh, table 4.2 is very similar to what you're being asked to do in Part C, if any of this is unclear. And just a quick note for you, the periodic table can't really help you on numbers of neutrons. While it is often the case with some of the early elements in the periodic table, that the number of protons and neutrons might be the same, that is definitely not an absolute rule. In fact, for hydrogen, most atoms of hydrogen have zero neutrons, even though they have one proton. So the only way to get the number of neutrons would be the mass number minus the number of protons. Looking ahead to part D, I'm sure that you have seen uh, these isotope symbols uh, where X would be an element symbol and then up here we have A as the mass number against protons plus neutrons and Z is the atomic number. So for example you've probably seen something like this already. So this is called carbon 14 and there is the mass number 14 and there is the atomic number, 6, for carbon. So this is just telling me that carbon has 6 protons, and 14 is protons plus neutrons. So to find the number of neutrons, that would just be 14 minus 6, which is 8. If there is no symbol up here saying plus or minus, then that means the atom is neutral and has the same protons as it does electrons. So 6 electrons in this case. Now I would ask you to not do part two, which asks you to determine uh, atomic mass for silver and takes you through some of those isotope uh, calculations. So just draw a single line through it and that's all that you need to do. Finally, answer question four and question five. You'll wanna make sure before you submit this exercise that you have completed all of the pre-lab and you want to make sure that you're taking pictures of the pre-lab and all other non-blank report sheet pages. 
So you're just going to follow the same procedure for submitting these experiments as you did for the previous experiments. If you have any questions, please contact your instructor as soon as possible. And that's going to be the end of this video on Experiment 4. Thank you.